Hello. Hello. Hello, who are you? Hi, Dr. Amla, you can hear me, right? Everything is okay? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Thank you so much for joining us. And I apologize uh, that we are a bit late. And uh, so, yes. So thank you, Dr. Amla. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'll just give a very quick, brief uh, introduction to yourself. Uh, you have been a clinical psychologist in the field of psychiatry and in eating disorders for 12 years now. You're one of the area of specialization is uh, CBT, which is cognitive behavior therapy, and then it's uh, DBT, which is dialectic uh, behavior therapy. And you work for uh, Rainbow Eating Disorder Center in Lahore. And uh, so we, we really thank you for joining us. And let me tell you that, you know, she is one of the renowned specialists in our country alongside Dr. Sohail and other wonderful teams. So Dr. Amna, please, uh, could you please tell us about yourself and your work and what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I must say thank you uh, to you and uh, your organization because uh, uh, if I particularly talk about Asia region and Pakistan, so mm -hmm. when we started working here in Pakistan, in Lahore in uh, 2012, that we actually <clears throat> established that uh, eating disorder center, which was the actually first and the only eating disorder working in Pakistan. So at that time, I just completed my uh, master's in clinical psychology and my MS in clinical and counseling psychology. So I joined the Dr. Suhail team as a clinical psychologist and uh, we start working on that area, which we only read in our syllabus, just one chapter. And at that time, when I started that career being the psychologist and start working in an eating disorder center, it was very new for even me. Okay, all, all those eating disorders are like real life issues that they are just pre read in uh, our syllabus. So later on, we start working on creating the awareness about eating disorders in different universities in Lahore, in like different regions, different schools. And later on, from all of that journey now, Alhamdulillah, we are very successfully treating all type of eating disorders in which we have more frequently reported here in Pakistan, the anorexia, the bulimia, and the binge eating disorder, uh, and ED, uh, NOS, which is like a mixture of all the symptoms. And we are working in a team, multidisciplinary team, where I am the lead psychology. We have the uh, psychiatrist, which is Dr. Sohail Sheikh. He's from New Zealand, and he has an intensive experience of treating the eating disorders. And we have a local uh, dietitian, so we train them locally how we can change uh, the concept of eating is not only a common sense. Food is not a common sense. So it's a science. So we are uh, actually working at helping our community on all the issues related to eating, weight, uh, body image, and the other psychological issues as well. So uh, Dr. Amla, if you could please tell us what, uh, what made Dr. Sohail, he's from uh, New Zealand, uh, start a center here because this is the first ED center in Pakistan. And as you said, this illness is very you, even you were quite surprised when you were joining this field. So what is the story behind the uh, Rainbow Eating Disorder Center? Okay, so basically Dr. Sohail is Pakistani national based and after uh, he completed his MBBS, uh, he uh, actually shifted in USA for his MD. And uh, over there he was like working with eating disorder patients. So uh, his major area of training at that time was in obesity mm -hmm. and 
disorders and later on he worked for about uh, six seven years in canada same he was working with eating disorder patients so at that time he clicked the idea why not this is a very serious problem why not if this is this area in psychiatry have the facilities in our country like pakistan mm -hmm. So with that aim to help our community, uh, while we are talking about schizophrenia, while we are talking about depression, anxiety, why the psychiatrists are not working on eating disorders? So he came with that goal, okay, we work here for our community, uh, for their mental wellness, for their mental health issues, not only focusing on those areas which are commonly treated at every hospital at every clinic and ignore the major area which is like obesity eating disorder and its related comorbid conditions so with that aim uh, he started in 2012 here in pa lahore pakistan and i joined his team from uh, 2013 until date we are working here on the same uh, goal so dr ramna i first met you in 2017 and um, could you please tell us about the prevalence of eating disorders in Pakistan? Okay, so uh, basically this is uh, another uh, dilemma for eating disorders when we talk about the statistics. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. we have very less research statistics on prevalence of eating disorders. But if I talk about my clinical practice, because I'm working from 2013 to onward in an eating disorder center, and we had a meeting in 2017, many years ago. So actually, if uh, I like some of the numbers, so it's alarming figure we have. Like on daily mm -hmm. basis, at least we have uh, about three to four patients reported with having the issues of eating uh, problems. And later on, when we do the diagnosis, we figure out out of those three, one has the eating disorders. So the number is like really very high. One uh, in three persons, if they have the eating disorders while they seek the help. So uh, this figure is like really alarming for us. But if I talk about the burden, in, uh, in the it's more higher than okay and uh, do you, i mean you know in west here we we don't really have a general consensus you can hear me right yes yes and uh, being uh, as a uh, phd student research on uh, the number of uh, having the Pakistan, and we are running a lot of uh, to figure out how many. Okay, I think I've been losing your voice. Um, sorry. I think maybe this is something Eco sound. You can hear the eco sound. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why this is happening. Uh, Okay, so, you know, um, Dr. Amina, in, in West, we don't have a general consensus on what causes eating disorders because it's a very dire, it, it, it is a very complicated illness. How about Pakistan? I mean, since you have started working uh, in this field, do you think in Pakistan maybe we have a general consensus or because, you know, the number we have in Pakistan is very small. So we don't, we can't do such a large scale comparative analysis or the studies. But how about Pakistan? Do we have a general consensus on what uh, causes uh, eating disorders in Pakistan? Yeah, I think uh, if being the mental health, I think you're, uh, you're, you can't hear me? I can't can hear you, but I have my the ego. I think we are losing your voice. I don't understand why this is happening. Uh, okay. uh, is it clear now? Am I audible? Yes, I, I think I can hear you now. You can hear me? I can hear you. So, that's to me. We must start some regional survey. So, if I start a survey, just only Lahore based. So it gave me at least one idea how much frequent eating disorders are here in Lahore. So we can do it 
uh, like on a massive level lately. I think we are back. Sorry, I don't know what is happening, but we keep on losing each other. So, yes, because I mean, sorry, I, I you know I would love to get your answer about the 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 general consensus of eating disorders in Pakistan. So, if you could please repeat yourself, I apologize. I don't know why this disturbance is happening. At all. So, my question is that to make it like practical. to have the actual number of prevalent uh, having eating disorders at least we start with from the region like uh, the first region we can start working uh, from lower to have the actual number of uh, uh, prevalence among eating disorders it must involve the government bodies because without the help of government we can't uh, do that massive survey to uh, have the prevalence uh, ratio of eating disorders So, Dr. Amna, do you think our culture plays a part in eating disorders? Okay, in our culture, first of all, I like actually become surprised the concept of food, the concept of healthy eating, the concept of body shape is really very weird. Because here, the concept of healthy food that contain more sugar, more carbs, more fats. In general terms, such foods are actually increasing the obesity in our uh, region. And Pakistan is on ninth number among the obese countries, fifth among among the most populous uh, countries. So I think uh, we are underdeveloped. We have lack of resources. We have a higher uh, prevalence of non-communicable diseases. So those are factors linked to mental health disorders. So definitely, we need to. Uh, work on all those related aspects of it we want to like how the eating disorder suffer in for, from our community thank you and are there any uh, common family dynamics in the eating disorders people i mean uh, do families cause eating disorders or no yeah definitely this is a very major contributing factor among our culture and uh, uh, which we noticed that uh, the increasing uh, the ratio of the concept of sadism the sad diet the con- control diet the dieting patterns mentality in the family members those are those are the first, uh, actually uh, red flag from family to encourage the children to think about restriction you focus on restriction abnormally it can lead to the disorder eating and eating disorders start from toward eating disorders so this is a very clear link of family practice uh, and the family culture in the development of eating disorders and the family practice is also a very major problem for being a uh, space while we are giving the treatment to patients the cause for them food again is a common sense if i want to lose weight family recommended not to eat eat less you can reduce and if you want to gain weight they recommend you to eat more and gain weight but they not have the focus on the cognitive processes where someone can develop the eating disorder so family uh, from my perspective and i will consider it for treatment as well we are not only treat the patient we actually educate the family as well to reduce the symptoms of early illness thank you thank you and um, your center uh, about men and eating disorders 
have they treated men with eating disorders and if they have you know what is the most common eating disorder in men you, know, you have uh, treated so far okay so as i mentioned earlier we have a mixture of uh, patients and even if we are treating two anorexic patients at one time so those two individuals are different their treatment plan for both of them are different so mainly we have a huge number of uh, patients having the eating disorders and now they are like, having a really healthy lives they are, like uh, well, put themselves out of eating disorder to manage their eating disorders well and many of them are now actually working in that field as well and this is a pride for us when our patient like uh, beat uh, the eating disorder they uh, get themselves out of the eating disorder and now they are helping the other sufferers yes um so dr amna i mean why do people use you know these behaviors like you know all the behaviors associated with eating disorders i mean are they using these behaviors as a tool to try uh, and help deal with their emotions are they sending out a message or is it a cry for help okay i think uh, for all type of eating disorders i'm not particularly focus on any subtype uh, eating disorders every time are the external solutions for internal problems so uh, our patient record shows that when those uh, individuals have more uh, disturbed family childhood issues when they have some personality traits to be hypersensitive to be like a uh, uh, very perfectionist so those traits lead toward the control need for control and when they were come to the external world they face the barriers so then at some point something triggers them to change the shape toward themselves control their drive and hunger is a drive your body is like related what you are feeding so their concept change from external control to internal control so every time the eating disorders are the external solutions for internal problems and when we work uh, on their uh, distress we work on their perception when we work on their self image so definitely we find a very helpful result your center i mean uh, you know what do you think causes eating disorders i mean uh, if i ask you i mean you have worked with so many people and also my another question would be your what is the i mean i know that you mentioned you know the the, the two main common eating disorders you're treating but what is the one most uh, i mean what uh, eating disorder has the highest number you have received Uh, uh, like if i uh, talk about the current uh, prevalence so the uh, lumia nervosa is more prevalent and the age group which we have here our center is about uh, 13 to 17 age group has more prevalence of the uh, lumia nervosa because uh, they love to eat they have a good relation with uh, food but for them the come uh, an enemy when they feed them so they hit the concept of guilt so this guilt push them to compensatory behaviors and it's like uh, their uh, start of bulimia and nowadays everyone is social media and social media has its good effect and social media has its negative effects as well so about the etiology of eating disorder so a uh, uh, holistic approach we need to focus because there are some biological issues there are some psychological issues and there are some social uh, context cultural related issues to be thin is nowadays a criteria so dr amna i mean are i mean you you spoke about social media so let's move to i mean the media i mean our pakistani media as well So I mean do you uh, monitor our media I mean uh, do you um, monitor it I mean because I know, I know in west uh, from b to you know the neda everybody does uh, uh, monitor media so do you think media causes eating disorders and uh, which media industry is it hollywood or bollywood that is influencing influencing our people the most and then we will come to our you know pakistani media if you could please find the answer 
So basically, as you know, this is the global concern because of the excessive use of social media. Now people get influence of, uh, uh, like it can be positive and it can be negative as well. Like po in positive sides, like we have our entertainment source, we have a like a, a broader uh, perspective approach, we can connect ourselves with uh, with the globe, but on the negative side, definitely uh, the uh, media, which is like, I'm not particularly focused on Bollywood, Hollywood, and Bollywood. So basically, uh, I'm uh, in a uh, journal term. Uh, media, social media, has a negative influence on those people having the eating disorders because uh, uh, now the media, even on some level, is discouraging the zero size. And encourage the upsize model, but this is very less. This is very less in journal. In journal, the majority is focusing on the glamorous aspect of the media. So I think this can be something we, uh, our nation is also affected. And the other thing is that rather than the industry media, our social media platforms play a very important role in development of eating disorders. Because now there are multiple filters on all apps. Like if you are on Insta, if you are on Snapchat, so people are obsessed with their looks. So it can be one triggering point which leads toward the eating disorders. Thank you, Dr. Ramna, for this answer. I mean, uh, if, you know, uh, if you really do study um, that, I think um, it is the media which is creating a lot of problems, and especially with the self-confidence. I mean, not everybody, uh, Dr. Amina, is, uh, is susceptible to you know, uh, these negative uh, comparisons. And not everyone uh, can go down that route. But I think, when, as you said, you know, when they are on these social media uh, platforms, and then these people, you know, uh, intentionally, unintentionally, they do start creating the comparisons, yes. So thank you for that. And, um, so what is the role of body dysmorphia? Is it caused? Yes. Is it a causation or is it more like a symptom? Okay, so now the concept change over a period of time from body dysmorphia to body dissatisfaction. So now body dysmorphia report less and body dissatisfaction reported more. In body dysmorphia, most of the time your focus is on your features and less on appearance. But for body dissatisfaction, your focus is more on appearance and less on features, which is a very uh, linked uh, symptom for all type of eating disorders. So now we need to work more on research side to make new advancement in the field of eating disorders for their uh, assessment, identification, and for their management as well. I think uh, we all work together for that noble cause and hopefully I'm very hopeful we work for our Asian region specifically and for all eating disorders in general. Because uh, Dr. Amna, recently there were lots of studies which came out of India and, uh, and you know, during the pandemic, I mean, even in Pakistan, uh, one of the biggest um, uh, complaints were that the children were, I mean, uh, changing. I mean, they, their behaviors were changing. And they said even in India, it was an article in, in a feminism magazine which was about that these children, they have their ideals. So you see, when you go to the rural area, because the lifestyle is so different, maybe a comment will be passed that, you know, you're gaining weight or you're losing weight or you're not this size, you're not Y size, uh, size but they don't end up developing eating disorders. So I think what is happening, I mean, uh, Yanni, the, the more uh, they're spending time on the social media, the more their mind is getting influenced. And then these thoughts, they do become self-fulfilling prophecy. And this is, you know, what they become. And it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot to do with the modern and current lifestyle as well. So I think, you know, what you said about the you know, body dysmorphia and uh, the body image is, is very, very true. I completely agree with that. And uh, when they asked someone in India, I mean, why the boy, were young, uh, boy was dieting, and he said because he wanted to look like, I forgot the name of their, one of their um, cricketer. He said he was exactly. so inspired by him, he just wanted to be like him. So it's very difficult to pull out. Yes, that even 
in Pakistan, only 6% of the physicians, like our major health system depend on the physician, general practitioners, only 6% of the physicians just have the training in obesity, weight management, and eating disorders. So you can imagine our uh, uh, nation is struggling with a huge dilemma, huge dilemma. Having the obesity, eating disorder, they are undiagnosed, untreated. So I think if we all work together on that cause to make more awareness and do more research in that area, I'm sure we can help our nation. Otherwise, it will be just a debate. <laughs> so I mean, which I mean, I know that you're you, you're talking about uh, you you spoke about bulimia and nervosa that this is you know one thing which is from age 13 to 17. But we know you know we know that you know. Um, the illness does not discriminate. I mean, every, you can't, I mean, you have children from five, age five, and, you know, you, you have someone 75, 80 plus, uh, the more advanced research is coming out from West, you know, where the elderly, even they have the eating disorder, right? So it doesn't discriminate, like the way cancer doesn't discriminate. Eating disorders don't discriminate either. So in your opinion, I mean, which uh, eating disorder did you find most easier to treat and why? Uh, from my perspective, I think eating disorder is very challenging to treat. So all type of eating disorders has its own complexities. And the more comorbidity with any eating disorder, it can be a challenge for a health professional to give the treatment because it reduces the prognosis. So the less comorbid conditions is a good sign to have a good prognosis. So I think if we have, because eating disorders have a, a very long-term treatment process. And most of the eating disorder patients actually show very poor compliance. And this is another challenge for our, uh, like us being the professionals to give a treatment to patients. So which is, I mean, I mean, I know that you didn't name one uh, subtype eating disorder, but, uh, but which is one, I mean, you think is the most difficult to treat? Because uh, there is a general... Anorexia. Because they have the self-imposed starvation, and that they have very much rigid and perfectionist stage to change them, to change their pattern. So anorexia is the most challenging one. So, Doctor um, Amna, you know you specialize in CBT and DBT. Please, could you tell our viewers about your about CBT and DBT and the difference and why this is you know uh, the two. Um, you was uh, I really appreciate 